Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the lineup. I'm LJ. I'm Mike. And we have a very special guest with us today, Sweeney Murdy, uh, formerly with WFAN and now with MLB Network. Thanks for joining us, Sweeney. Of course, guys. How you doing? Good. Everything's great. Doing well. Yeah. Excited to have you. We got, uh, we got some cool stories about to, be, uh, about to come about, so we're excited for that. Fantastic! I love being in the baseball circle, right? It was like, like you guys are baseball guys because you, you know, you were players and and you grew up with that. I love people like can kind of inc- get to include me now. Like I spent so much time around the game and I didn't play it nearly to the level that you guys did. I was done when I was twelve, right? But I got to be around the game and and take it in from a different perspective. And uh, mm-hmm. you know, I, uh, I I love when I get to talk to you guys about things like that because you know, it's just. You know, I love the respect you guys give me when you come, when people like you talk to me about baseball because you know it from a different level than I do. Yeah, oh, definitely. Uh, let's uh, get a little background information. Um, I know that you were your first generation Indian American, correct? Yes. It, yeah, born and raised in uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, born in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Grew up in Middletown, right outside, about ten miles outside Harrisburg. You know, you guys, you know, know the Eastern yep. League. It's uh, yep. Double A. Uh, it was the uh, it's the Nationals for a long time now. Uh, Expos before that. It was first a Pirates team when I was in high school, uh, then became an Expos team. So uh, yeah, minor league town um, and, and uh, Middletown, Pennsylvania. And uh, yeah, my parents moved to uh, Philadelphia from India in the early 1960s. Became Phillies fans, became baseball fans, and that's kind of where it all started for me. That's awesome. And when and when uh, would you say it started for you your interest in, in doing what you're doing now? When I was in seventh grade, uh, our middle school, we called it junior high back then, was, had, a, had an actual radio station uh, oh, cool. that uh, was, on, was on the public dial. It's still actually in operation in Middletown, Pennsylvania. It's 91.1 WMSS, um, and it's run by students in grades seven through 12. Wow. I joined when I was in seventh grade. Uh, by eighth grade, I was doing regular DJ shifts and news and sports, things like that. By ninth grade, I was doing play-by-play of our uh, school's football and, and basketball games, and I was in, I was all in. And it, it's about that time that I kind of made the connection. It's funny, I just have this here, I didn't. I, I brought a prop, I didn't really realize. <laughs> this is uh, Harry Callis and, and Richie Agasper, uh-huh. uh, Phillies announcers uh, from when I was growing up. And uh, you know, Richie Ashburn's in the Baseball Hall of Fame, Harry Callis is a Hall of Fame announcer. Yep. Um, so uh, represented there. <laughs> Those guys are the guys who I grew up listening to when I was listening to Phillies games uh, in Pennsylvania. And about that time when I started broadcasting games in high school, I started to realize that's an actual job. That's a career. Mm -hmm. And that was my way into sports because I wasn't a good enough athlete and I wasn't going to make that my vocation. So, uh, but learning to, uh, to be a broadcaster at a young age and then kind of putting two and two together, I, um, I found what I wanted to do. That's awesome. That is. And would you say uh, those guys that you just showed us, uh, Harry, uh, would you say they were probably one of your first role models in in uh, getting into this industry? Harry Callis is who I wanted to be. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I wanted to be a play by play announcer. I never I never got there. Um, but, you know, other other avenues opened up as I got into the business that that really you know helped um Help me along. It didn't have to be play by play for me to consider it a uh, a successful venture. I spent 35 years in in professional radio, um, and um, I called one game of play by play, which is one more than a lot of people, and it was awesome. Oh, yeah, that's uh, so cool. Yeah. But it's um, he's who I wanted to be, um, and it was uh, you know, and I, I got to meet him a few times and work with him briefly as well. It was um, you know, and his son Todd is is a terrific play by play announcer with the Houston Astros. Uh, has been a friend for a long time. So, and I've I've told him, you know, plenty of times, like, you know, he Todd's like only a couple of years older than me, but I said, listen, your dad's the reason I I wanted to get into this business. So yeah, it's um, uh, he's definitely one of the people that uh, uh, that yeah, you kind of what it goes back to when I when I put two and two together and realize what that guy's doing is a real job, and that's what I wanted to do. Right, that's cool. Yeah, so you wanted to be him, but then you became you. You became sweet, the the infamous Sweeney Murdy. You know? And now, now kids that are looking up to do what you're doing on the radio, they have somebody like you. It's it's you know model. it's a really nice thought to uh, to you know to have because I've had high school students and college students who who you know kind of want to pick my brain about the industry and and look at what I've done and, and think of it as a, as a successful career and um, I've you know. 
the broadcasting part side of me is no longer there right now. The job I do for MLB is uh, is a little bit different. I do still have some appearances here and there, but I'm not a regular fixture on the air anymore. So I kind of consider that radio portion of my career closed. But for uh, well, for now anyway. But for people who who like ask me for uh, advice and, and looked at my my life on WFAN as, as successful, it really is kind of meaningful because I think Definitely. the way I kind of looked at it, guys, and I think you'd appreciate this, um, the the successful ball players that I that I covered, I covered some people who played for 10, 15, 20 years, they always talked about it in terms of, I never thought, okay, I'm going to do this for 20 years, like, I'm going to do this today. <laughs> And hopefully I'll be good enough that they let me come back and do it again tomorrow. So right? True. And that's the existence that, that yeah. you guys live. So true. And that's kind of like I kind of felt like that was that was how I was doing my job. Like like I, I never took it for granted that somebody's gonna let me cover the Yankees for twenty two years. I just hope that I didn't screw it up enough today so they tell me not to come back tomorrow, <laughs> right? And um that's that's another kind of like little connection kinship I feel with with ball players is that that was the mentality that I took that was how I thought about my job and lo and behold by the time I was done oh my gosh 22 years went by me covering the New York wow. Yankees and and that's what it became and I think more and more that you talk to players who had long careers I, I get the sense that they thought of it the same way mm-hmm there's no doubt. Yeah, and, and speaking of the Yankees, how, how did you uh, get started with the Yankees? Well, I started at WFAN um, as a producer, much like your crew right there, right? I was producing radio shows. and um, I got an internship at WFAN when I was in college, after my junior year at Penn State. About a year after graduation, I was still in Harrisburg and got offered a job to come back as a producer. So I moved to WFAN. This is 1993, moved to New York. Uh, I had not yet turned 23 years old. I worked my way up the ladder there as a producer. Um, among the many shows that I got to produce were broadcasts live at Lee Mazzilli's Sports Cafe on West There's 70th. No way. That's uh, crazy. Between <laughs> Amsterdam and West End. 1994, 95, I think we did those shows. That's crazy. Uh, Howie Rose was hosting. I was a producer. Uh, your dad would show up and like I listen, I give him credit. I won't tell him this to his face, I'll tell you. Like he I, I would see him like pick up like dishes and like he'd he'd be bus helping bus tables. Like yeah. he wasn't just there to shake hands. Like he'd actually be making sure the place was running well. But we hosted we did radio shows there and I was a producer lining up guests and stuff for those. Um and then worked my way up to an on air anchor. And then I spent one year at WIP in Philadelphia actually, ninety seven to ninety eight, and then I came back to WFAM. And after a couple of years doing updates on the radio station, uh, the job of covering the Yankees kind of opened up. Susan Waldman was moving to a different role and the actual beat reporting job at the radio station came open. And I told him I was interested and I, I, I got it. And Good for you, as, that's awesome. You know, kind of like what, like, well, you guys know, you get you get the opportunity and you keep, what we were talking about before, you just hope they, they, they let you come back tomorrow. And that's what happened. <laughs> That's awesome. Would you would you say is that the first time that you that you met me? Was is that the Lima Zilli Sports Cafe? I don't remember meeting you there. How like I must have been like four or five at that point. Okay, so the the place that I remember, I kind of teased this with Mike before we started. The place that I remember seeing you and, and LJ, I kind of I'll wrap this up to the story that you and I talked about last week. We saw each other too. Is that I remember seeing you guys on the road um, at the Vet in Philadelphia. And it was an interleague series, my first season, which was 2001. And and it was actually kind of cool because I was walking into that clubhouse to start covering the Yankees in 2001. And your dad was one of the few people that I actually knew. Like I was walking into a clubhouse that had, you know, mm -hmm. Jeter and Bernie and Posada and Mariano and all these great players, Joe Torre, you know, guys who end up going to be in the Hall of Fame and all-stars. And I actually knew one of the coaches because I had – you know, done the radio shows, and uh, and he remembered me, and obvi obviously from there. So it was it was fun to reconnect with him there. But I I vividly remember you and your sister coming to a game at the vet in Philadelphia, and you were standing along the rail as the team was coming out to stretch. So 2001, you're probably what 10, 9, 10, 10? 11, yeah. Okay, so I remember you guys there, and and him just kind of sharing a moment with you guys <laughs> there on the field, and uh, a couple of things about that same actually. 
just coincidentally about that same series that I remember is um, I saw I saw an old Philly standing probably right around where you guys were, an ex Phillies pitcher, and I went up to I went up to your dad and I said, "Hey, Maz, do you remember a July Fourth doubleheader against the Phillies in '78? You hit a game-winning grand slam." He goes, "Of course." I said, who'd you hit that off of? He said, Larry Christensen. I said, turn around. He's standing right behind you. No way. <laughs> no and, way. And uh, that was, uh, so I recognized uh, Larry Christensen standing there and just kind of had that little fun with your dad there. But I also remember tying this back up. I remember walking into the vet for the first game of that series, and I was still a new guy on the beat, and I'm walking into the press box with a couple other reporters. Harry Callis is walking down the hall the other direction from us, right, oh, towards man. us. Yeah. And... I had I had known and met Harry, you know, worked with him a little bit previously. This is the first time I'd seen him in probably I don't know two years at least, two years. So I'm coming down the hall, and the other guys with me are like, "Oh my gosh, that's Harry Callis!" And Harry looks up, he goes, in that big, great, famous voice of his, he goes, "Hi, Sweeney, how are you?" That's great. <laughs> and it was like I felt like I hit a home run. You yeah. Know? Like. It was pretty cool to have that full circle, you know, that voice, and mm-hmm. give me that recognition when I was still kind of the new guy. It just, it just felt pretty cool. That All of cool. that from from that series at the vet, which is the first time I saw you, and the next time I saw you was probably I don't know, like ten years later. Yeah, yeah. I can only imagine what you were doing on the field. <laughs> I could, I know what Lacey was doing, standing there. You were probably yeah. trying to hit. Yeah, probably. <clears throat> I'm not a bat boy. Who knows? <laughs> Back then. I th- I just think about I'm trying to think about some stories that that you could have had over the last 25 30 years. I I think that there's got to be who were who were some of the guys that give you the best interviews, who are some of the guys the best interactions. Those are there's quite a different characters in the locker room. So like Yeah, you know, and, and it's funny too cuz a lot of times you know Sure, certainly there are people who are like quote unquote good interviews or bad interviews, but mm-hmm. a lot of that comes from me. Like my job is to get them to talk, right? I agree. So, yeah. um, a lot of that's like I feel like a lot of that responsibility is on me. If they're not giving me good answers, then maybe I need to ask better questions, right? Yeah, and, and also and build that trust too. Yeah, uh, with with the players, it's big time. And and I I think the the, the um, strategy I took my first year. As I told you, I walked into a room full of, you know, multiple time World Series champions and all-stars already. That's like, tough. who am I? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wasn't going to try to be anybody's best friend or have them be my go-to guy right from day one. Right. I just kind of decided that I was just going to show up and do my job and 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 just keep doing it. I was in it for the long haul, right? Mm-hmm. I wasn't going to try to be Derek Jeter's best friend on the first day and, and yep. try to pull all those strings. Mm-hmm. I just want to show up and do my job and then keep coming back to do it. And the thing that I recognize all these years later, like what you guys are good at, you guys are good at scouting other people, right? Mm -hmm. Like you watch, when you watch players in the field, you watch, it it kind of carries over into the rest of your life too. You're always kind of like watching and and trying to figure people out and you get a handle for who they are. And when I look back and think about that, I think that played to my advantage a little bit because I didn't have to, I didn't. I didn't go in trying to impress everybody and and make them like me. I just wanted to go do my job. Yeah, and you're a professional. As they watched me do it, I think that built LJ the trust that you're talking about yes. and the familiarity. I mean, specifically, you know what I remember? The 2001 season is my first year, and it goes you know all the way into the World Series against Arizona. Um, I mean, I've started my first day on that on the job is what, like February 10th, right? Right. And then now we're talking like first week in November in the World Series because got everything got pushed back after 9/11. Um, I I specifically remember after I can't remember if it was either Game Four or Game Five, but one of the games Yankees came from behind to win against Arizona um, with the home runs and the extra inning, um, yeah, uh, uh, walk off. Martinez. It was one of those games. You know, and there's a, there's always a huge crowd of uh, media, at obviously the World Series, and it becomes harder to get around certain players. Like I'm a radio reporter, so I have a microphone in my hand. Um, proximity to the person I'm talking to matters, mm-hmm. right? 
can't be standing on the outside of the circle by someone's locker 30 feet away. You know, my equipment doesn't work that way, so I need to right. get closer. But sometimes it's impossible to do that. So I remember there's a there's a huge crowd around Jorge Posada's locker, and um, I couldn't even get close to him. I think O'Neill, same thing, if I'm remembering right. Um, but as the crowd finally breaks away, I move a little bit closer, and I, I remember running into Posada, and I stop him. And he says, and he looks at, and, and he looks at me. He knows I want something, right? He knows I, I and and I, and I'm frustrated because I haven't gotten like any, I haven't gotten close to any of these guys yet, not close enough to record what I need to record for the radio. And he looks at me. He goes, "Are you going to let me go home now?" <laughs> I, said, I said, "Yes, but can I please ask you two questions?" I said, "Sure." So, like that was something that. You know, that was just a moment of recognition in my mind of here's somebody who, who I've seen every day for the last nine months. You know, I'm going to give him I'm, I'm going to give him this because he's been through this with us. Right? right. He's he's walked the walk with us. And as much as I want to leave, I, like like he got it. He understood that there were, you know, 400 people around his locker and I couldn't get to him. And none of those 400 people were there on February 10th in Tampa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. I like to think that those are the kinds of things, the way that you just, you show up every day and there's a recognition factor. And just, like I said, you guys, you guys watch everything, you scout people and you kind of just kind of figure out the way somebody goes about their job. Absolutely. So true. You, and you, you humanize it, you know, we're all humans. Yeah. You, keep it, you bring it down to that level, you, you stay professional. And like you say, you do your job and that goes a long way with players when they're scouting guys like that. Um, you know, just to get a comfortability factor. I, I like to do stuff with people that are consistent in what they're doing, um, professional, you know, respectable. And, uh, you know, it sounds like that's that's the route you took and it, and it went a long way with all these guys. I mean, I, I hope it, I hope that's how it came off. That's, you know, looking back, that's kind of what I tried to do. And, but again, it wasn't all a conscious effort. I do. The conscious effort I do remember was that I just I just knew I wasn't going to become anybody's best friend overnight. And that wasn't the goal. So yeah. it was just to just show up every day and and just try to try to survive. Try not to get try not to get your your ass kicked and and try, hopefully get to come back tomorrow. Yeah, I'm just thinking about the time I had my first uh, walk off air. Oh, and I had, I had my first. So my first my fourth game in the big leagues had a walk off air, and I'm sitting in my locker, and Michael Young comes in and says, "Hey, you know everyone's about to come over. And they're about to give you. They want some questions." What do you mean they're going to ask me? Don't they know I'm upset? <laughs> it's like, Mike, this is the only time. You know, like there's – you got to be able to handle these questions. You, you're going to answer it this way. But the way they handled me after is how I got a lot of respect from them because I was new. And they did their interview, and then they stuck around with me. Mike, this is no big deal. Like, listen, this is going to happen. You're going to make that play out. But they, they stuck around and gave me that word of advice. They could have just mm – -hmm. oh, now it's the next one. So like it was like they knew it was hard for me. I was 22. Fourth game, I make a game. First yeah. game, standing ovation. Fourth game, wa uh, yeah, Kansas City walk off air. Then sixth game, walk off hit. I'm like, I can't handle this. I, I need yeah, yeah. like, <laughs> I, I need this. I don't need this anymore. But they, sure. they really had so much professionalism with me that made me comfortable to interact with them. And that's that's what you gave all the guys there. I think I think the you know the the kid and it was great to listen. Not everybody gets that that Michael yeah, Young went over to you and, and told you. Not everybody gets that benefit. Not everybody has a player right, like that who absolutely. will who will you know give you that kind of thing. So that must have been huge for you just to start with. Instead um, of them surrounding me, like wait, yeah, on, you know? it can be overwhelming, right? Yeah. Because here you here's the thing that you know I think to try to explain to to, to fans who aren't on, who who don't know what the dynamic is, you know. You're allowed what is what they call like a ten minute cooling off period, right? Mm -hmm. But then, and then reporters come into the, to the clubhouse, and it, it's different in other places. Some places it's three or four, some places it's ten or twenty, right? Depending on the city and the market and the interest in the team and all that stuff. Um, but when you come into a play ten minutes after a game, like like you, players' emotions are still high, yep. and everybody's personality is different. And I understand that, but you know, it takes understanding of both sides. That, of course. That, this is now our job to do, and we're going to be respectful of you if you just be respectful of us, right? Yep. And we ask you a couple of questions because this is the play that, listen, Mike, in of your course. case, it was the play. This that is the story of the game, yeah. is that play. No mm -hmm. doubt. 
And the thing that the thing when we, when we talk to try, try to talk to players about like why it's important, here's why: because you get to tell your side, okay, and you get to put your voice on mm-hmm. that. If you if you had for whatever reason chosen to walk away and say, "I'm not All talking right. to them. I'm yeah. leaving." Yep. You have now forfeited your right to tell that side of the story. And anything I or anybody else wants to say about that play or about that game or whatever, it's you can't you can't come back to us and say, "Oh, you said this, you said that." You know, a player we're giving the player the opportunity to speak to it. And it's not all, you know, this isn't all, you know, Tom Cruise, Jack Nicholson, you can't handle the truth, right? It's mm-hmm. you know, it's it, it's usually pretty easy, "Hey, tell us what happened." Because most of us are have, have watched and are human enough to know. But the idea of, like I heard somebody say, I think it was on the captain, right? Last, I think Jeter said this. He's like, like he says, what do you mean what happened? I missed it. You saw it, right? Yeah, Something right. like that. It's like, I get it. But nobody wants to hear me say it, okay? There's 30,000 people who are at the game today who are driving home, and they spent you know a lot of their mm-hmm. hard-earned money to come watch the game. And they're not tuning in to find out whether you know what happened to the game you lost because they all know you're going to lose some games, but better not be today when I spent six hundred dollars to bring my right. family to the game, right? right? So what happened on that play? Just say it, and it's over, right? Mm-hmm. And I think what what I always took the mentality I always took to try to get that point across was that the fans don't want to hear me say it was a bad loss. Right. They want to hear me say that it's a tough stretch. They want to hear you say it because they care and they just want to know you care too. And I think that's what drives what fans are trying to get when they're listening to interviews. They just want to know that you care. And if you messed up and you say messed up, they'll be, you know, that's, that's it. all. Yeah, it was, it was done after that. I feel like this should be like a, you know, one of the meetings we have in spring training every year that get get everybody ready on different angles. Uh, you know, handling the media, just this perspective, like play, players having this perspective, understanding that well, this isn't just you now, telling Jay, your own story. You know, the yeah. Yankees have media training. They've done it for over 10 years now, I think. And um, they make sure the players are aware of what the dynamic is mm-hmm. and what That's could important. trip them up and try to prepare them so that, so it doesn't trip them up. Yeah. And, and we're part of that. Like listen, we're not, we're not all trying to play gotcha. You know, mm-hmm. we're not yeah. all trying to get you to say something that's going to make you look bad and that we go, ha ha, yeah. gotcha. That's it's- the stance a lot of players think. You know, that's what they take. Right. You know, right. Uh, I had it a little bit with the Cubs. I-, I had a tough situation with Chris Bryant. I don't know if you remember, he had 11 days till he was supposed to be called up so they could lose his service time. So sure. for me, the-, the Cubs, that was the big story, the whole spring training. So every time. I'm in my locker. It was even after a good game. Hey, what about Chris? You know, like great game there. Like, do you ever think about that? They kept pushing me to say that one thing, and I just I had to like just say, listen, it's, Chris is a great player. Like, there's no, especially when he got sent down. Hey, Mike, what do you think about that? Do you want me to say, of course he deserves to be here because he does, but I can't say that. I have right, to right. say, listen, I. Chris is a great player. He's going to be here when his time's right. Like not you know, in your control. But I like, felt you don't them, make those decisions. That yeah, kind of I, thing, right? I felt them baiting me more and more as the spring training because they wanted that big story. I didn't have that with any other team. It was like I think the the Cubs just once they got that big story of Chris Bryant because he was the face mm-hmm. he, when he was coming up. He was everything.